I had a question uh, whether it's okay to take pictures. Uh, if you want to take pictures of me, you can. Uh, I'm not sure who'd want to. Um, are the doors between the rooms normally open? Okay. Uh, I'll just wait until they get closed and then uh, so I don't talk over the other speaker. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for coming at the end of the day to kind of a, a mundane talk on, uh, on uh, not hacking computers. Um, as some of you may know, I like to hack on different things. Uh, I write uh, for 2600 uh, a column called the Telecom Informer, and I've been writing that for, I think, the past seven years now on page 13 uh, of every issue. And so uh, as I've been doing that, I've gotten to travel around the world quite a lot. Um, and so I've learned a bit about uh, how to do that for really cheap or free. Um, and that's grown into me getting really interested in the hows and the whys of uh, how travel is priced and how people like us can maybe uh, take advantage of some mistake fares and other techniques. Um, I visited all seven continents. Not many people can say that, but uh, I've actually like managed to do it on a pretty shoestring budget. You know, I'm not actually making a lot of money. Uh, I've been uh, working in China on a Chinese salary, and so. You know, it doesn't actually take a huge amount of money to do this. Um, my first overseas trip uh, that was a big overseas trip actually was in 1996, and it was on a mistake fare. It was $299 Canadian. Uh, I told my college roommates that I was going to Tokyo for the weekend, and they didn't believe me, but I actually did. Uh, so, um, you know, and at that back at the time, like, that was around $200 US. So, you know, the thing is, like, this isn't new. Uh, none of these techniques that I'm going to share are particularly new. It's just uh, they're not especially well known right now. Um, as I mentioned, I lived and worked in Beijing from 2010 through 2013. So, you know, uh, traveling from there, I didn't have a lot of money, so I had to learn how to do it kind of on the cheap. And uh, the last year, I lived and studied in the Netherlands uh, and Costa Rica. Um, so, you know, again, like I had no income and was still traveling. Uh, this is where I've been in 2014 uh, so far. Um, it doesn't cover trips that I've planned. Like I have another round the world trip coming up and a trip to Europe in, I think, a month. Uh, on top of that, but you know, this is this is so far where I've been. Uh, the one thing I'm not super happy with is my carbon footprint. Um, that's one thing that if you you really care about the environment, you should pay attention to. If you start uh, travel hacking, you can end up uh, having a whopping carbon carbon footprint like I do. So be sure that what you're getting out of travel is you know actually worth your environmental impact. Um, you know, you can call me uh, some kind of like weird green hippie. But actually, we're all completely screwed if we don't pay attention to the environment more than we do. Um, so here's some of the interesting places I've been. Uh, I went to Antarctica, Armenia, Bosnia, North Korea, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. You can read the list. Um, yeah, a couple of the more interesting places uh, are Palau and Sealand, uh, both pretty rarely visited. Uh, penguins are cool. Um, that's me with the North Korean admiral of all the crazy things. Uh, it's And uh, this is the police officer who arrested me in Armenia, but it all worked out at the end. So um, <laughs> it, it really did. So uh, yeah, go ahead. by the way, stay out of jail in foreign countries. It's a good idea. Uh, so uh, what is travel hacking exactly? You know, like when we talk about hacking stuff, like how can you hack travel? Uh, well. There are mistake fares. There are some routing tricks that you can play. Uh, there's some loopholes in frequent flyer programs. Uh, there's, you know, credit card bonuses that you can get sometimes through frequent flyer programs. There's really a lot more. You know, you'll find a ton of stuff written on the internet, but that actually, like, that only scratches the surface. There's way more than that. So use your hacker brain and think like a hacker because it really is up to your imagination how you can get away with, uh, seeing the world for surprisingly little. So uh, what, to me, makes an awesome travel hack? Um, you know, there's a few criteria that I think that are like fairly important when it comes to what's a hack uh, versus what isn't. Um, I think a hack is something that allows you to travel for little or for nothing. And you know, there's a really big difference here. Um, 
you you'll read a lot of stuff about upgrade hacks where you can you know maybe buy a more expensive fare but for cheaper than it would normally be, and then it's an upgradable fare, right? Well, that isn't a hack. You didn't hack anything. You paid the airline more. You lost. They won. I mean, this is uh, so that's not a hack. Be sure you you pay attention to what a hack really is. Um, you know, something uh, that's a hack is entirely legal under the contract. Uh, and it's something that the airline can't decide to just take back later. And that's a fairly important point. Like, so sometimes you can get a hack and get away with something, but if it isn't legal under the contract, I mean, that's like a really sketchy hack. Uh, and especially if you are doing that on a round trip itinerary and you get found out halfway through, or even worse, like not even at the final destination of your itinerary, you can have a real problem. Uh, so frequent flyer hacks are a great example of this. Um, there are a lot of things you can do with frequent flyer programs. Sometimes you can uh, get away with a surprising amount um, until you can't. Because with frequent flyer programs, the, the rules allow the airline to pretty much do whatever the hell they want. And that can be a real problem. Uh, so what else is a hack? It's not something that's really well known. Because if it's well known, it's going to get shut down. Um, you know, this isn't like hacking computers, because actually, if you find an awesome travel hack, it's going to cost somebody real tangible cash. And that tends to get watched more carefully than things like security vulnerabilities or, or like whether you're patched, right? Um, so if it's published on dozens of travel blogs, whatever you're, you found isn't going to last for long. Uh, and, you know, finally, like a travel hack takes you somewhere that's safe. It, uh, it takes you somewhere you actually would want to visit. And uh, I'll give you an example. Like, there's this one blogger who gets caught up in this stuff, and he was writing about how he went to San Pedro Sula, Honduras. Uh, if you look that place up, like, it's one of the most dangerous places in the world. You know, you can't go out at night. It's, uh, you know, you're dodging bullets, essentially. Um, risking your life isn't a travel hack unless that's really what you wanted to do. Uh, or, you know, another thing you might think is, wow, you found a really great deal, uh, except it's to the Caribbean in the hurricane season, and then, you know, you're spending all of your time there uh, behind plywood and hoping you don't get mowed down and blown away like Dorothy. It's just not good. So uh, make sure your hack's a real hack. Like, that's actually the first sanity check that I would always uh, suggest when you start getting into this stuff, because it's very easy to get caught up in what's a good deal or free. And, uh, well, you know, poop is also free. You don't necessarily want it. Um, so, uh, mistake fares. Uh, what's a mistake fare? Uh, so, airlines will occasionally publish these, and it's like that $299 trip that I got to Tokyo. Somebody screwed up. Um, you know, airfares are entered by humans. Uh, they can enter the, like, wrong number, and so all of a sudden, like, something that should have started with a 4 is starting with a 1 on the numeric keypad. It happens. Uh, this, in the past year, this has happened an awful lot, like an unusual amount, even for, uh, airlines. Um, you know, Delta, United, uh, via this, like, crazy Norwegian site called Wittero, it's like one of the, uh, it's a Star Alliance affiliate carrier. Uh, and all Italia have all had really bad mistake fares, you know, uh, fares as little as zero dollars plus tax. Um, you know, one example of the, of a mistake fare is a fare that I'm taking in November. I'm going from Los Angeles to Boston to Rome to Budapest to Amsterdam to Beijing. And what I paid for that was mostly just tax. It was four hundred and fifty dollars and thirty cents. You can never get out of the tax with a mistake fare, but, you know, because those are priced separately. But, you know, most of this is tax. So uh, by the time you get done with the, uh, calculating the value of the frequent flyer miles that I will earn on this mistake fare, because I actually will earn miles, it, it's like paying $219. And yes, I'm in Beijing at the end of this, so I had to get back to the U.S., unless I just decided to live in Beijing again. Um, so I paid uh, 30,000 miles that I got for free uh, with Alaska Airlines. And, uh, you know, that's like the $450.30 that I quoted, like includes the tax that I paid to get back from Beijing to L.A. So, and uh, in addition to that, I'll show you later that I added on a free trip to Seattle for Christmas because that's a possibility using a loophole. Uh, so... Uh, Mistake fares are usually pretty safe to use if you find them. Because if the fare is at least a dollar, 
you have a contract. And the great thing with contracts is if you want to get out of them, you totally can't get out of a contract with an airline, right? You know, there's a $250 change fee, or if it's Delta, like, com tickets are now completely non-refundable. So why should you let them out of their contract? You shouldn't. Uh, don't feel bad about holding them to it. Uh, it but if the fare is zero dollars, you don't have a contract. They could just refund the tax that you paid because that was collected on behalf of the government. It wasn't actually uh, a fare, so they could probably make a plausible argument that you don't have a contract. Lately, airlines have just been honoring these things. You know, it's just it's they don't want to take it to court because if there's legal precedent, it could get really bad for them if it doesn't go their way. So so far, like as long as it's not costing them too much, they're just going ahead and honoring. Uh, the mistake fares that are out there. But there is a really glaring exception, right? This is super risky with frequent flyer programs. So um, you may find a mistake fare with frequent flyer points. And one of these happened around nine months ago with United. There were these uh, tickets that were advertised at the wrong number of miles. So you could go to Europe for, you know, basically like the number of points of taking a short haul flight within the US. And United didn't honor this. Like, they totally didn't. They said, nope, uh, in the fine print, in the contract of the Mileage Plus program, we don't have to honor it and we're not going to. And they just refunded everybody their miles and whatever money they paid, and they totally didn't honor those tickets at all. And there wasn't a contract, because the contract with a frequent flyer ticket is different. It's It essentially says, we can do whatever the hell we want. Uh, you have no recourse. Uh, you are completely at our mercy. And... Uh, that's pretty much, you know, what the contract says, even though it's six pages, that's what's in it. So um, the other fun thing is if an airline thinks you did something sketchy to, to get that mistake, uh, frequent flyer redemption, then they can actually say, you are a bad, evil hacker, we found you on Google. And clearly, like, the fact that you're doing this is because you're a hacker, and we're taking away all your miles. And even if you paid for those miles, they can totally do it because in the contract, it just basically says that uh, all of the rules and the interpretation of the rules are completely up to them. So uh, here's the key. Know where you have leverage. If you have leverage, don't feel bad using it. But if you don't have any leverage, like, you know, just know when to go quietly away and not be the angry guy uh, who's trying to argue on the phone with somebody who could actually make things way worse than they already are. So, uh, what's a fuel dump? Um, <laughs> fuel dumps are, are something that I think that everybody in this room will be really, really interested in. So, uh, and there's not a lot of detail on this slide for a reason, right? Um, I don't want it to be searchable. So, airline tickets are priced through these very crusty old legacy systems that were made, you know, that were put together like largely in the 60s and 70s. A lot of airline pricing is, is done with like sketchy joins on flat file databases using, you know, COBOL. And at some point of complexity, sometimes the calculations can break down. And so there are like a lot of techniques that can be used uh, to combine. This generally only works on international itineraries and it generally only works on intercontinental itineraries, right? So. You need to be going from one continent to another continent, for example, North America to South America or North America to Europe, something Europe to Asia, you know, throw Africa in there somewhere. Uh, continents are, are designated if you do some searching on the internet by numbers. So you've got like C1, C2, C3, that kind of thing. Um, and what you can do is you can introduce a certain element of complexity into a search. Uh, into a fare search whereby the calculation will drop out the fuel surcharge if you introduce the correct amount of complexity. And so what am I talking about? Um, well, if you do, uh, if you were, for example, to do what's called the third strike, um, I'm, I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. Is there somebody who's working on the mixer? Could maybe turn it down a little. Um, I'll try to back up a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah, that's not going to work. There we go. Sorry about that, guys. Testing one, two, three. Should I pretend?
checked. Okay. Meow. 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 Okay, there we go. Um, I hope that uh, that meowing wasn't on video. This is going to show up on some uh, some YouTube video later. <laughs> I don't know. Anything you ever do on camera, you've got a problem. Um, so, okay. So, what if you can make a fuel surcharge go away? That's really awesome. Because, uh, so in order to do these like tax dodges that aren't particularly scrupulous, uh, airlines sometimes uh, will price a fare like a dollar for the fare and $400 for a fuel surcharge. Because they have to pay tax on the fare, but they don't have to pay tax on the fuel surcharge. That's why airlines do this. That's why a fuel dump is possible. So um, basically, if you are able to find a way to make the that fuel surcharge go away, you can have a fare that's a dollar. Well, a fare that's a dollar is a fare that's a dollar. Like on the last slide that we, we talked about, uh, if you paid a dollar for your fare, then you have a contract. And, you know, if the fuel surcharge was something they just failed to price, um, basically that's on them and it's not on you. So, you know, there are a couple of techniques that you can do, and essentially what they involve are, uh, you know, I'll get to this on a later slide um, to, to explain how it works, but here's an example of what a fuel dump can look like. Um, so I'm taking this trip, uh, and it was $219. That, the technique that, you know, like after the value of the miles uh, was $219, and the technique that was involved here was a fuel dump. Um, Alitalia was trying to dodge their tax, and it ended up costing them far more. So, um, miles and points. Uh, simultaneously, they're the, the easiest and the most frustrating way to travel for free. Uh, it's uh, not just frequent flyer programs. There's actually some bank programs, and there's some hotel programs that you can use. So why do I say that they're simultaneously the easiest and the most frustrating? Um, it's really easy to get points, and it's actually generally fairly hard to, to use them, uh, unless you get really good at finding some unconventional ways of, uh, of redeeming them. So one of the things that I uh, write about a lot on C31B, which is uh, my travel blog, um, is unconventional ways to find frequent flyer inventory, and you know how you can actually maybe be able to cash in these points for a trip that's free, but it's not in the good seat. You know, it's going to be in like seat 31B, like this seat right here, all the way in the back of the plane, you know, next to the toilets. Uh, that's not the seat you want to be sitting in um, with the chemical smell of yuck wafting over you every time the door opens. But if it was free, probably it's okay. And, you know, that's the seat you're getting because that's the seat that they give away for free. Uh, you just have to be very creative in how you search for things. Uh, Bank programs. Well, bank programs are interesting. There's a lot of, uh, you know, there are a lot of banks that are trying to get into this game, and they they have these points. Uh, City has thank you reward points. Uh, if you talk to Chase, they have their own form of point. Uh, American Express, like most people know about their points. Um, these points are both really good and really bad. They're great because they have a variety of different programs that you can transfer them into, or you can actually just spend them like money. So most bank programs, uh, the points will be worth a penny each. So if you sign up for a new credit card and it comes with 50,000 bank points, typically it's going to be good for like $500, you know, good toward a ticket that you book through, you know, like Expedia, like a captive Expedia portal, essentially. Um, that's usually not the best value for redeeming these things because you can usually transfer them sometimes with bonuses into airline frequent flyer programs or even hotel programs which then can transfer into airline programs. So before you go redeem your bank points, it's a you know you kind of need to like put together a spreadsheet and figure out what the best redemption value is going to be. Uh, and there's a lot of websites that can help you do that. But bank points are freaking dangerous. And the reason why they are is so the, the way bank points are the best is they have these, like they slice up spending into categories. So you can get these like 
awesome category bonuses of like five points for a dollar if you spend them at certain kinds of merchants. So what if, for example, uh, you found that drugstores uh, paid five times points and a valid drugstore purchase was something called a vanilla reload, uh, which could then be used to uh, load an American Express prepaid product called a Bluebird. And so basically you're just moving cash around in a circle and getting five points per dollar that you move in a circle. Um, well, you know, a lot of people did this. And uh, there are two banks, uh, Capital One and Chase, that just began to cut people off and take all their points. Because, you know, the thing with these programs is the fine print basically says, you know, similar to frequent flyer programs, the fine print says the bank can pretty much do whatever the hell they want and any time they want. And if they decide to just shut you down and take all your points, they can totally do that because points aren't money. They can be redeemed for money and, you know, like it's a club and you're a member of it. And if they kick you out of the club for like whatever reason, then you just don't get any value realized. And it's all totally legal. And if you want to sue, you can't because you have to take it to arbitration, right? So this is, uh, you know, this stuff is pretty risky. Um, but you can get some really good value from bank programs. Just bear in mind that if you milk it too much, you might get shut down. Uh, hotel programs, uh, these are pretty useful. Like they're not good just for hotels. Uh, Starwood points, for example, uh, they're fantastic points because you can transfer them to a variety of uh, airline programs and you can also redeem them at Starwood hotels. Um, like you know, like uh, bank points and frequent flyer points, if you tick off Starwood too much, uh, they can also shut you down and take away your points, but they don't have a record for doing this. They've actually been like a very stable mileage earning currency. So Starwood is actually like, uh, you know, one of the, it's considered one of the better loyalty currencies in the business. So um, if you have a way to earn like a lot of hotel points, like that may be something that you would consider doing. Um, so miles and points hacks. Uh, there's uh, credit card sign up bonuses. So like a lot of these guys, uh, a lot of banks will have sign up bonuses at various times that are like pretty high to hit their quarterly numbers. Um, you know, I did an internship at a very large bank and I saw people all around me trying to hit quarterly targets. You know, this, this is like a very common thing. Um, right now is not the end of a quarter. So it's not a great time to run out and start signing up for, uh, you know, for credit card mileage programs. There's only one good one right now, which is a 50,000 point bonus from, uh, from Chase for their United, United Mileage Plus card. Uh, there are some links out there that'll waive the annual fee, give you a $50 statement credit, and uh, give you 50,000 points for free. And these are, you know, that's good for two free round trip tickets within North America. So it's not a bad deal. Uh, that's the kind of the benchmark of what, what you should be looking at as a good deal. Um, well, can you sign up for more than one credit card? You sure can. Uh, I do these things called Apparama, where I'll apply for like six or seven cards all on the same day. And it doesn't actually like freak out the banks when you're hitting your credit seven times on the same day because it doesn't um, like this is a kind of a FICO hack. It doesn't lower your score like each time you do it on the same day. It lowers it a lot the next day. So you'll end up getting approved for all these cards and then like your credit score will take like, you know, a 20 point hit or something. But the funny part is like six months later, your credit score is back up above where it was before because you have so many accounts you're managing well and your average credit utilization is down. So it's, it's kind of, it's kind of weird. Like, uh, you know, my, my score went up 10 points after my last Apparama. Um, and so what you have to do to get a credit card sign up bonus typically is you sign up for a new card. Um, watch the blogs that you're looking at because most of these have affiliate links and you're going to be making the blogger like 50 or $100, but you know, you may not be getting the best deal out there. Uh, so there's a site that I like a lot called freefrequentflyermiles.com. It's like just some total miles nerd and he's always got the best links and they're not affiliate ones. So, um, you know, that's, that's a good place to look. Uh, but basically if you're going to do sign up bonuses, uh, there's a couple of things you've got to do. Uh, you typically have to hit a minimum spend and then you really need to stay on top of uh, like when the annual fee is due and whether it's waived. Uh, what I think a good credit card sign up bonus deal is, is one where the minimum spend is not a huge amount and you don't actually have to like pay the annual fee the first year because then you can just cancel the card after you get the points. The banks don't like it, but it's great for you. 
uh, manufactured spending. We talked about that a little bit. So, um, you know, there's a couple of ways that you can do manufactured spending. Essentially what that is, is you're buying something that you can then turn into cash. So you're not actually spending the money. You're, you know, maybe you're paying some small fees along the way, but, you know, you're getting the miles and you're not really spending the money. Um, use your hacker brain to think of the kinds of things that you can buy uh, in order to manufacture spend. Uh, if you look on travel blogs, like a lot of people were buying this product at CVS drugstores called the Vanilla Reload, which is this like, you know, there's all these products for people who can't get bank accounts. Uh, and one of them is called the American Express Bluebird, which is uh, a Walmart product. It's like a partnership with American Express and Walmart, right? And you can kind of use it as like a, a pseudo bank account if you can't get a bank account uh, for whatever reason, like bad credit or, or what have you. Um, well, you know, you can use it as well if you don't have bad credit. There's no reason why not. Um, and the best part with, with, uh, with this particular product is there's like a lot of different ways to reload it. So you can buy a product for $503.95 called a Vanilla Reload that'll put $500 in credit into your American Express Bluebird, which you can then, by the way, ACH, ACH transfer to your bank. So, you know, essentially you're paying $4 per, you know, $500 that you move. Well, that's shut down. You can't buy these with a the credit card anymore, but you can buy other things that you can load a Bluebird with uh, in different ways. You know, and you're, you're, you're going to have to figure this out on your own because I can't spoon feed everybody. But uh, I am sure that uh, using your hacker brain, you will figure out what kind of products that you can buy that you might be able to load a Bluebird with. But what else is there besides a Bluebird? There's, that's not the only, like, I'm poor and can't get a bank account product in the U.S. That's just the one that all the travel bloggers are pushing. There's way more. So if you start thinking like a hacker and doing your research, you're going to find ways to move enormous amounts of money. And what does that do for you? Well, you earn typically a point for every dollar that you spend, or two, or three, because you do this with category bonuses, right? So what can end up happening is if you spend your weekends, like, or at least part of your weekend, you know, like running around to a few stores, you can very easily get yourself, you know, enough points for tickets to anywhere in the world you want to go for cheap or very free. So I want to talk a little bit about extreme couponing because uh, this is something that's, that's super cool. And it doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's super awesome. Um, and oh, uh, back to manufactured spending for a minute because this is kind of like a cross between extreme couponing and manufactured spending. There was a, uh, there was a deal with the U.S. Mint not too long ago. Uh, this, this was two years ago now where you could buy an unlimited amount of coins with your credit card, because uh, they were trying to get $1 coins into circulation, and you could buy these Sacagaweas and pay with your credit card, and they, you know, the delivery was free. And then you could just take them down to the bank and deposit them, because they came in rolls. You know, like banks weren't super happy to get them, but they have to take deposits of US currency, like they're required to do this. So. Basically, for free, you could just manufacture as many miles as you wanted, and it took like six months before the U.S. Mint figured out this was a really bad deal for them, because they were paying all the uh, all the credit card fees all along, right? You know, you're you're buying dollars for like less than a dollar. It's a great deal for you, terrible deal for the government, but you know, fine. That that actually lasted for like a long time. Yeah, you know, there's guys that got millions of miles from this. That's almost a form of extreme couponing. Uh, there's a guy named David Phillips. Uh, and this is a very famous case of extreme couponing with the, uh, with the Advantage program from American Airlines. This guy manufactured, you know, more than a million miles. So Healthy Choice, uh, which for those of you outside of the, you know, from outside of the U.S. is a brand of very unhealthy frozen food here in the United <laughs> States. Um, it, uh, they ran a promo where you could get a certain number of points for every, for, for proof of purchase of uh, every Healthy Choice product that you bought. And so you had to mail like the, the UPC symbol, which is like the, the barcode on the package. Um, and it turns out that there's one Healthy Choice product they missed uh, that was really, really cheap. It's like a 25 cent carton of pudding that actually has like a cardboard overlay and a UPC symbol you could tear off. So uh, this is an old case, like this was from 2000, uh, just before 2000. And uh, so David went around to all of his local stores and said that he was stocking up for Y2K. And he bought 
er, like every single pallet of healthy choice pudding he could get his hands on. Uh, he you know, tore off all the UPC symbols, sent them in, and he was able to get more than a million miles for doing this. The best part of all is he donated the pudding to his local food bank and was able to get a tax deduction for what he spent. So, um, <laughs> you know, this is, uh, this is uh, you know, basically like that's a form of extreme couponing. Now, this one got famous because it was so big and so creative, but there are smaller opportunities to do extreme couponing all the time because uh, there are all these frequent flyer programs that allow you to to get ex you know additional miles for spending in certain categories, often through short shopping portals from a company called Cartera. So uh, Alaska Airlines has mileage plan shopping, for example. Um, for a while, until they shut this down after I believe it lasted a week, uh, you could get uh, buy American Express gift cards with no fee and 10, time, 10 points per dollar spent. <laughs> so, you know, American Express gift cards aren't quite cash. It's hard to turn those into cash. Uh, you actually have to use the Amex gift cards to buy something else that you can then turn into cash. But, you know, by the time you get done, like the, the number of miles and points that you could get if you hit this really hard was, you know, like a fairly insane amount. And, you know, that's something that happened a month and a half ago. So these things happen all the time. You just need to look very carefully, think like a hacker, and when there is an opportunity, jump on it right away. And that's that's actually something that I hope that you guys will think about, like for anything involving an airline. If there's a good deal, right now. Don't wait, don't think, don't consider, don't talk to people, just buy it right now, do it right now, because if it's a good deal right now, like if the, the moment that the airline figures out it's a good deal, it's not gonna be there. Um, so mileage runs, uh, I'll show you guys a slide in a minute to, you know, the, that'll explain uh, mileage runs in a little more detail. Um, but it's basically taking extra flights to get more miles without paying more. Uh, and finally, uh, buy miles promos. So airlines all sell miles. Uh, for example, um, you know, right now there's a promo to buy Avianca miles. But Avianca announced the devaluation of their program. They're actually like making the miles less valuable uh, by and how, by how much? Nobody knows. Uh, they're not saying. So, you know, they've given some examples of, of where they're going to adjust the award chart, but nobody knows exactly how much they're going to devalue this program. So, um, you know, you're buying a pig in a poke unless you plan to redeem the miles immediately. So, uh, buy miles programs are basically super risky. I wouldn't do it unless you have an immediate plan to use the miles right now. But in general, don't hold on to miles. Use them right now. They always drop in value. Uh, so credit cards, you know, I just want to like underscore that when you're dealing with credit cards, they're really a deal with the devil. Um, most of the, most, the most lucrative bonuses are with credit cards. Um, but there's like typically a minimum spend requirement, so you got to spend a certain amount of money in a limited period of time. So you have to like stay on top of when you need to do that and make sure you do it, or you've just you know lost the annual fee potentially and not gotten anything for it. Um, and you know you should consider how to meet the minimum spend in some unconventional ways if you don't actually want to do that amount of spending. So don't go out and buy stuff you don't need just to hit a bonus. That's like, that's that's just bad finance. It's gonna cost you more in the long run. So, you know, if you don't manage this and stay on top of it really well, and you know, I'm talking to a really smart audience here, right? So, you know, this is maybe something I don't need to tell you guys, but it's, you know, banks make most of their money through people making horrible financial decisions. And, uh, you know, it just happens to all of us at some point that we've gotten screwed by a bank. So if you don't manage this well, you're going to end up paying far more than the value of the miles. And actually, that's how banks make their money. They count on this. Uh, so I, myself, am a big fan of free miles. I really like free. Uh, it's easy to get caught up in this. And then, you know, you find out that you've got three platinum cards with $500 annual fees each and you, you just kind of wonder how that happened. And, you know, don't get caught up in the miles, like get caught up in, in the travel because that's the thing that I think is the most important. Um, so mileage runs, what, what makes a mistake fare even better? Uh, you can combine it with a mistake routing. Um, and what that'll do is get you more miles. So mistake fares will, will still earn miles. Uh, the mistake round the world trip I'm making uh, is earning me miles to do it. Uh, it's getting harder to do mileage runs profitably. 
but it's still possible. And what do I mean by it's getting hard to do them profitably? Well, um, airlines are changing their frequent flyer programs to be based more on what you spend. And Southwest and uh, JetBlue are two examples of airlines where, you know, their frequent flyer program gives you credit based on what your spending is as opposed to the amount of travel that you do. Uh, United and Delta are doing the same thing next year. Uh, for now, American and Alaska Airlines are sticking with the traditional uh, mileage-based programs. So you can, you know, and you know, through the end of 2014, uh, you can still milk uh, United and Delta for what they're worth. Um, it's still possible to do mileage runs, so do keep a, you know, do keep a, an eye out for good fares to places that you want to go, and then see if you can add in extra segments to get more miles. Uh, Theflightdeal.com, like that's a great site to look at. Um, I love that site uh, for finding exceptionally low fares to different parts of the world. I went to Ecuador for under uh, $400 on a tip that they found me. And uh, flyertalk.com, uh, there's a forum there and there's a, it's called Mileage Run. And a lot of people uh, in that Mileage Run forum will post some incredible deals. Uh, so you might also want to have a look. So, um, some pitfalls to mileage runs, you know, I, I already talked about this. Uh, there's revenue-based uh, changes to frequent flyer programs coming soon. Uh, it's more expensive to get miles this way than to get it them other ways. Um, what do I mean by that? Well, you're buying airfare and you're flying, like, you know, that's always more expensive than, than spending on a credit card or something like that. Uh, you know, your butt has to be in the seat for all those segments. So, you know, if you're gonna fly to like, Tokyo and turn around and fly back, you know, that's 20 hours in a plane. <laughs> and yes, you earn the miles and they may have been really cheap, but do you actually want to do that? Like, you know, you're going to be wedged in economy that whole way. It may not be much fun. Um, and finally, you know, don't get caught up in the miles. Uh, and that's, that's a really important thing. You know, some people like really love this game and they, you know, they want to get the high score. And you know, remember why we do this. It's to be able to go awesome places and see stuff. There's a guy who posted about going to Australia, turning around in the Sydney airport, and flying back from Australia just to get the miles. And, you know, of course the Australia, he was worried, you know, what the Australian Immigration and Customs was going to think. Um, they probably thought the same thing I do. This guy is insane. He went all the way to Australia without seeing a single kangaroo. Like, that's just dumb. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> um, so uh, mileage run picture, just so you can kind of wrap your head around what I mean. Um, so here's an example of a trip that you could combine Aeromexico and Delta on. So if you can combine a Delta on, with an Aeromexico SkyTeam itinerary, you could potentially route through all of the Delta hubs if you wanted to. Um, so the first routing is a direct routing, which is like LAX to Mexico City on Delta and then Mexico City to Quito uh, on Aeromexico. And that would be like a conventional routing. Well, you can get almost double the number of miles if you were to go like to LA to Salt Lake, to Seattle, to Minneapolis, to Atlanta, to Mexico City, and then on from there to Quito. Uh, your butt's gonna be really sore at the end of all that. Um, it's, it's not going to be a whole lot of fun, but you would get double the miles, and it may not cost you more than just the extra segment taxes. So, you know, uh, consider whether there is an opportunity to add in more segments if you want to earn more miles. It can be a very cheap way to do this, but it can also be not a lot of fun. Um, so do actually factor that as well. Do you want to spend your limited amount of time off, uh, you know, sitting in an airplane instead of seeing where you went? Uh, so, uh, free one-way. Uh, some airlines are going to allow you to book international travel with a stopover. And if you, this is on award tickets, right? So if you can do that, that's an awesome opportunity because the stopover can be like for pretty much as long as you want to do. Um, so a few weeks ago, I was in New York uh, for a conference called HOPE that 2600 does, uh, Hackers on Planet Earth. And uh, actually, like that ticket that I took to Hope was an extension of a trip that, I, that started in China. Because I actually booked a ticket uh, from Kunming in China. It's like, it's in Yunnan uh, near Tibet uh, to Hong Kong. And then I went from there to uh, Los Angeles, right? But why stop there? Why not do a stopover? If you know you're going to be traveling on from LA somewhere sometime, like 
why not actually add that trip as part of the itinerary, right? So uh, that's exactly what I did. Um, I added on a segment to Vancouver and then on to JFK. Like, now why would I route through Canada to get to JFK? Like, that doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, right? Well, the reason why I did is because that's what was available. Because it can be very, very hard to find frequent flyer itineraries. So consider unconventional ways of getting somewhere. Uh, it turns out that Cathay Pacific, which is a Hong Kong-based airline, runs one flight a day from Vancouver to JFK, and they have availability fairly often. And Alaska Airlines, which is an American Airlines partner, has a flight directly from LA to Vancouver. So, and it lines up nicely and you can connect. So why not fly through Canada to get somewhere in the US? You can totally get away with doing that as long as one of the carriers on the route is a US-based carrier. Otherwise, you're doing something called cabotage, uh, which is, you know I wrote about on my website. Um, that can get you in a lot of trouble if, if you book that, if you succeed in booking it, because it can get the airline fined. So you might find that you've, you've, had, uh, you've had trouble. So no trips between points in the US on a foreign airline. But if you've got one US, segment, US to foreign segment involved, then it's no problem. So that's exactly what I did, and it totally worked. Um, why not plan a free one way the next time that you book a frequent flyer ticket? So hidden cities, uh, you can get off the plane in a transfer city. Uh, so what that means is if you're flying to, for example, Guam, and you're leaving from LA, and your trip goes via Tokyo, because that's how a lot of trips to Guam are routed, uh, you then have an LA to Tokyo and Tokyo to Guam uh, itinerary. Well, what if it was 25,000 miles to go to Guam and it was 35,000 miles to go to Tokyo? I mean, you could just book a ticket to Guam and get off in Tokyo, and a lot of people do this, right? Um, so the problem is, this isn't without risk, because through Tokyo is not the only way to get to Guam. You could actually be routed through Honolulu and, uh, and onward. So if there's something that goes wrong with, the, uh, with your itinerary in the meantime, um, you know, for example, like say that the flight to Tokyo gets canceled, like the airline may just reroute you, and they're not going to reroute you to your connecting city. They're going to reroute you to your final destination, which means that you may find yourself on the way to Honolulu instead of on the way to Tokyo, which isn't exactly what you'd planned. So I don't actually recommend you make, you know, if you do this, uh, oh, and the other thing is the airline's totally going to know what you did. So it can be risky. Um, they could decide that you violated the terms of their frequent flyer program and take away your miles. Uh, they usually don't, but maybe they do. So, you know, it's not without risk to do this. Um, consider whether the risk is worthwhile. Uh, you know, Life Miles uh, with Avianca, like they didn't know where Guam was, I guess. They're not very good with US geography. So uh, they thought that Guam was part of the continental US and they were charging a 25,000 mile round trip when it should be like 50,000 miles. Uh, and, you know, routing you through Tokyo or Taipei to do it. Uh, that deal is now dead, um, but it is something you were able to do for a while. There are many more tricks like this. Many, many, many more tricks like this. Uh, hidden cities are definitely something you can exploit. Just be careful if you do. Um, so, uh, call to action, and then I'll get back uh, really quickly to some more, you know, I know a lot of you guys wanted to hear some more details on, you know, before we had this microphone problem on, uh, on exactly what you can do to hack um, fares with uh, fuel dumps. Um, so, cost isn't a real barrier to travel anymore. It really isn't. Like, if you're from a developed Western country, it's just, it's completely affordable to, to visit almost anywhere on the planet. So people in this room have a really unique perspective, and I think that that's super important. Um, the, you know, the, the perspective that we have on the kinds of problems that people have with technology and how we can solve them uh, is something that's exceedingly valuable, and I don't think I can overstate that. I mean, you know, basically, if, you know, there are very few people who have the level of technical talent that we do and who can actually put all the pieces together to see the kinds of ways that we can actually help. But you've got to get out there. You've got to go actually see the problems people are having. You've got to see where we can help with technology. Uh, you've got to see where you can fit and where you can do your part. Or actually all of that goes to waste. 
and you end up working for some giant corporation uh, to, to work on a security problem when actually you could be working on a creativity problem that could improve the lives of millions of people. And that's something that I've learned through my travels. Uh, you know, having visited all seven continents, I've seen so many problems that, uh, you know, that I alone can't solve. And if the people in this room uh, really started to get out more, uh, I think that there's no limit to what we as hackers could do to make the world a better place. Uh, so uh, with that, um, I'd like to uh, invite you to have a look at my uh, website, which is all about travel hacking and, uh, and some travel techniques and tips and hints. Uh, it's called seat31b.com, uh, which references that terrible seat in the back of the plane uh, that you're going to get uh, if you are traveling for free. Uh, most travel blogs that you're looking at are just trying to sell you a credit card. So, you know, there can be great information out there. Uh, don't, uh, don't think that there isn't. But at the same time, um, you know, do keep in mind like that that's how they make their money and that's how they pay the bills. Uh, I'm not doing this for commercial reasons. I'm doing this because I'm very passionate about the subject. Uh, there are no ads and, I, and no affiliate links on my site. So I think that uh, you can find, you know, what you find there is probably trustworthy. Um, so back to pricing engines, because this is something that I know a lot of you are trying to think about how to script already. Um, I'll give you guys an example of something you can do uh, that's called a third strike. So suppose that you want to fly from Las Vegas to where? Somebody give me an interesting place to go. No, it doesn't like it has to be out of the out of uh, North America. Uh, well, who says who thinks Nova Scotia isn't in North America? You fail at geography. <laughs> okay, I I heard Taipei. Uh, that's that's cool. I like Taipei a lot. They have a really tall building there. Anywhere else? Uh, Kathmandu. Kathmandu. Okay, that's that's the most interesting place that I've heard. Let's. Uh, I haven't been there actually. Uh, so we're going to Nepal. Great. Um, so Kathmandu. So you want to go to Kathmandu, and you find that there is a fare to Kathmandu on. Who the hell even flies to Kathmandu? Air India? Um, sure, why not? Air India. And let's say Air India hates paying taxes. You know, do you like paying taxes? It's like none of us like paying taxes, right? Airlines don't either. So they have a fare to Kathmandu from New York. And it costs, so it's like New York, Delhi, Delhi, Kathmandu, right? And, and the same in reverse. And the fare is an incredible fare. It's $35 each way with a $472 fuel surcharge. Um, and guess who Air India just joined? They just joined the Star Alliance, which means that you can combine their fares with any other Star Alliance carrier, of which there is also a carrier called United. You may have heard of them. So what's a third strike? You book New York, Delhi, Delhi, Kathmandu, and the same in reverse. And then three weeks later, you book an inter-island flight from Honolulu to Maui on United. This forces the fare to be priced through the Star Alliance pricing engine, which doesn't account for fuel surcharges, which then drops off that $472 each way fuel surcharge, leaving you with a fare of $70 plus your homeland security entry fee and all your applicable segment taxes and whatever the Indians and the and the Nepalese want to charge you. So you end up paying like, you know, 150 bucks or something to go to Kathmandu. That uh, technique was called the pineapple poke. Lots of people were poking a lot of pineapples. Uh, unfortunately, um, it like it started there were so many people poking pineapples that it started having like a fairly serious impact on the load factors of the inter-island flights in Hawaii. Like there were just all these people not showing up. And uh, so United started investigating why that was and they uncovered you know, what people were doing, which is why the pineapple poke no longer works. But imagine that you find something that is a flight within the same alliance that's in a different continent and it's something that you can add as that that's a really cheap fare to add because the way this works is it just you know it adds on another fare and it you know it ends up breaking the whole fare construction right uh, so let's suppose for sake of argument and this argument is not a valid one so you know so this is just an example suppose there's a great fare you found for 50 bucks 
uh, from Guam to Palau. It'll never happen, but they're close by. Uh, that's And you found that on United because they do fly there. That's another example of something you could add on. So um, nobody, interestingly enough, has scripted any of this. And you know, there's like a whole uh, a whole bunch of logic that could be scripted to find third strikes, and so that's something that that could be you know potentially very interesting. Uh, these things don't work uh, for domestic trips. So uh, let's add uh, another technique called a first strike, similar to a third strike, except that you're hopping a border, and you're doing it with the first hop of a flight. So if you're somebody like me who used to live in Seattle, that's not far from Vancouver or from Victoria. So you could start out uh, from Vancouver or Victoria going somewhere within, um, you know, from, from North America to the, from Canada through the U.S. and then onward to a third country outside of the North American continent. And you could end up dropping a fuel surcharge that way. That, you know, Air Canada was super vulnerable to this. Um, and so many people were taking advantage that, you know, finally they fixed it for the most part. It's not 100% fixed, but for the most part it's fixed now. Uh, the problem with the first strike is you actually have to show up for the first leg of your trip. So like these third strikes are great because you can book them between like two cities in India, for example, and like never show up and it doesn't matter. Um, you know, and have it like, you know, a month later, like after your trip is already complete, you know, it's, it's like basically like there's no impact on you if they cancel the end of your itinerary. So what, you're already where you want to be. For a first strike, you have to show up for the first leg. So that means if you're like from Buffalo, you have to drive to Toronto and, and fly from there. Um, you know, it, it's not really practical for most people, but uh, these things, you know, because it's not practical for most people, like there's a ton of, ton of really bad stuff you can do from Tijuana. So, you know, keep that in mind. Um, great. So uh, with that, I'm the last talk of the day, I think. So I have probably as long as I want uh, for questions, if you guys have any questions, and uh, thanks for being a very patient and attentive audience. Is there a microphone that people can that can be passed around for questions or anything? Or okay, hey. Okay, so for the benefit of the video, the question is, uh, the gentleman lives in remote, uh, a remote part of Wisconsin with a very small airport, but there is commercial air service there, and the fares tend to be much higher from this airport than going to Chicago or Milwaukee where there's more competition. So he's wondering, how do, you, how do I fly for a, reason, for a reasonable price from my small airport uh, in my hometown? And that's like actually a really big you know, a really important question for a lot of people in America because um, the essential air service subsidy, which has been bringing air service to many, many smaller communities around the country, has been cut back in recent years as the U.S.